Welcome back you all for chapter four, Becoming a Competent Parent. Most family members find their greatest happiness in life comes from their relationships with their families. Although family is the most meaningful relationship in people's lives, it is also the most demanding. Parents may tell you that having a baby is easy, but raising them, well, that can sometimes be difficult. Becoming a caring parent requires more dedication, patience, persistence, and control than anything else that people do. To become competent with any skill requires study and experience. Parenting competence is no different. Becoming a competent parent requires learning what is needed to become a good parent. So let's talk a little bit about that. So let's talk about family relationships and how they relate to parenting. Though families have changed over the years, the family remains the foundation upon, what, upon which most societies are built. The, primary, the couple's primary relationship should be their family. A strong marriage supports both spouses and helps them be better people. A good marriage can provide solid ground upon which to build strong parent-child relationships. Children are greatly influenced by their parents' relationship. Children can sense their parents' happiness, and when they do, these children feel secure in their families and free to grow and pursue their own goals. However, children can also sense if their parents have a weak marriage, and this can often lead to stress in their lives. Children who grow up in a strong family may be better prepared than other children to succeed as adults. In strong families, members are dedicated to each other's welfare and happiness. They support each other in good times and bad. And they do that support by needs and goals. Strong families recognize each member's needs and their goals. They contribute, they rec also recognize each member of the family's contribution. They show respect and support by respecting one another. And when family members support one another, they develop trust. Children learn that they can depend upon their parents and look to them for love, support, and nurturance. Strong families also spend time together. Feelings of appreciation, support, trust, and respect develop when family members spend time together. Communication is also a key component to developing a strong family relationship. In strong families, members feel free to share their joys and their sorrows. Good communication is the basis for solving the problems that occur within every family. In a strong family, members understand the importance of communication and help them solve these problems. Strong families may not have all the resources they need, but they make the most of what they have. In a strong family, members work as a team and share their resources. Strong, strong families also share strong moral standards. Moral standards may be an expression of religious faith. However, they can also stem from a natural concern for other people and the world in which they live. A sense of family identity comes from family rituals and traditions. Children learn very early that their families have special ways of doing things. So how does parenting support child development? And why do parents need to know about child development? Parents need to support, parents need to support development by having realistic expectations and attitudes. Research shows many parents do not know enough about child development. Effective parents need to understand how children grow and develop. Growth is a process that begins with pregnancy and continues through adulthood. Growth refers to an increase in size, strength, or ability. Development, however, means a change of function as a result of that growth. Development refers to progress in skills and abilities, and develop, development is me measured excuse me, in stages, and it occurs in a very orderly sequence. And we know about child development from the three areas of development, physical development, intellectual or cognitive development, and then social and emotional development.
in lots of cases and lots of times when we, when we refer to maturation in the process and that sequence, each child is almost like each other. That's why we call those developmental milestones and how they follow that sequence. However, each child is also like no other, and that comes from heredity. Um, so a lot of times heredity and environment make that, okay? They affect it so much in forming that total person. So we know that parents need to recognize the uniqueness of their children from birth. And you can have two, three, four children and all three, two, three, four of them are going to be different. Children are born, and that's because children are born with certain temperaments or tendencies to react emotionally in certain ways. And we usually categorize um, children in three categories, those easy children. They just generally have a very positive attitude. They're easygoing. You know, they get along so well with others. Then there's those difficult children. They have a very difficult temperament and they can be, they, because they have a difficult temperament, they can provide lots of parenting challenges. These are fussy children. They don't sleep well. Their eating and sleeping habits are very irregular. Um, and they don't very, these children also don't respond very well to unfamiliar people. And then they're the slow to warm up children. Okay. At first they kind of respond neg negatively to new situations or new people, but the more they are around them and the more they become uh, actively involved, they can they kind of warm up to new people and new experiences. So because parenting goes in two directions, parents' temperaments also affect the child relationship. Due to their own temperaments, parents may encourage or discourage their children's traits. Parents often encourage traits that are similar to their own and discourage traits that are less like their own. And we also know that in order to do that, it requires nurturing, okay? And that's how that attachment begins. Nothing is more important to children than parents who nurture them by being sensitive and responsive to their needs. And all the nurture, and through that nurturing, attachment develops. And we know that attachment are those lasting emotional relationships that begin in infancy and, and tie the child to their parents and later to other important adults. And attachment is a result of very significant relationships. And when children feel unconditional love and have their needs met, they are generally willing to comply to their parents' wishes. And Here's the key, and we know this so much, that parents are the primary teacher. They are their child's first teacher. And they need to do this by providing sensory stimulation to children through direct teaching. And that means that the parent is deliberately instructing the child on how to do something. And then also encouraging them to try new things. Because when a child feels confident about trying something, then they're gonna get out, they're gonna get the most out of their life, okay, as a child. Um, I'm trying to just go through your chapter and hit the hot spots. Um, I want you to pay particular attention in your textbook to the guidance and positive discipline. It starts on page 88 of chapter four. And, I, and to recognize the difference between what is, gui what is guidance, okay, and how does it relate to um, positive discipline. Now, guidance is the act of directing and influencing a person towards a very specific behavior, okay? Um, and it's, a, it's an ongoing process. You don't do it one time and then forget about it. You got to do it over and over and over again. And guidance can be direct or it can be indirect. Um, direct guidance includes directing and supervising children until they have self-control. And then but indirect guidance can be how parents influence their children by their positive actions, such as their parents practicing self-control, okay? Uh, positive discipline is the process of intentionally teaching and training a child to behave in an appropriate way. Uh, guidance and discipline should not be confused with punishment. Punishment is an actual penalty, and it's a penalty that's that for when a person does wrong, okay? Punishment is a consequence for inappropriate behavior. So how do children learn positive behaviors? They learn them um, by their parents' efforts to schedule and teach certain but physical behaviors such as sleeping through the night, weaning them, toilet training. Parents must also help their children learn positive behavior. Positive behavior is behavior that is acceptable 
healthy and satisfying for the child and for those around him or her. And we can do that through direct teaching, okay, where we, where we tell them, we instruct them about the proper ways to behave and we explain to them how they should act, okay? And then in a result, the children and, and how they should behave. Um, children, how do they learn behavior? They intentionally copy others by imitating them. Um, they constantly observe their parents and those others that are that are like their other caregivers. And they're waiting for a chance to experiment for themselves. Um, we know that trial and error is another way that they learn and also through reinforcement. And parenting is a, is a group activity, okay? It's a, it's, we should think about parenting as a team, okay? Um, and know that parents may have different temperaments. They come from different families and cultural beliefs. And so that's going to have an impact on it. And they also, most of the time, parents tend to parent the way they were parented, okay? And so because of these things and parenting as a team, we know there's going to be times of disagreement. However, when we're disagreeing, intense forms of bickering back and forth when it becomes very intense is not healthy for children at all. However, a child hearing and watching their parents um, with some differences can be healthy, okay, if they're exposed to differences of, of opinion, and because they can see how those parents work together to solve and find a solution, okay, but if it's intense, it doesn't need to be in front of the children, because we want to be able to set that positive parenting tone with children. And I think if you look through your chapter, there goes on to tell us how to do that by using a, being a positive role model, using positive words, helping children set, uh, and then setting very real, realistic parenting goals and then helping children achieve those, okay? By providing that positive structure that they need. Uh, having a daily routine, monitoring the amount of stimulation that children get. Um, if we know that there's going to be a change happening, that we kind of go ahead and try to prepare them for that early, okay? There's also a piece in this chapter about setting limits and rules for your children. And so you might want to read through that um, as well. Um, I think I think I covered everything, especially everything that you're going to see that's going to be on your quiz. Uh, the last page of your textbook is page one, I mean, of this chapter is page 106. And it has, um, it's kind of summary of the chapter. So I also encourage you to read over that. So thanks for joining me. I know this one was a little bit longer, uh, but I needed to cover, a, you know, a few more things. So anyway, I appreciate you listening and um, I'll see you next time. Okay. Bye-bye.